Hi, this is Jeff Tayden. I'm a senior engineer with East West Manufacturing in Atlanta, Georgia. And this seminar is about the top 10 commandments for injection molding. So uh, this is for engineers who are developing or auditing an injection molded part. Uh, this is not a comprehensive uh, exercise on injection molded parts, but more of a holistic, uh, broad-based approach on some of the top issues that we have to contend with as custom molders and some things you can do to make uh, your injection mold parts easier to manufacture and cheaper. So the first commandment for injection molding is to utilize constant wall thickness. So uh, injection molded parts will shrink according to how thick the part is in a certain area. So you'll notice a part here that's been designed well has a consistent wall so it will shrink in a consistent very predictable manner whereas a part that has different uh, thicknesses throughout it are going to shrink in, in different uh, different amounts uh, in those directions and will cause unsightly um, sink and cosmetic errors. So it's important to make sure that the um, material thickness is constant throughout the part. This also eliminates uh, some flow uh, anomalies, things like eddying and currents, which are going to create other cosmetic uh, defects in the part. So it's important to make sure that we have a constant wall th thickness throughout our part. Uh, another benefit of having a constant wall is that it will cool in the least amount of time possible. So the majority of your cycle time or the time it takes for the part to eject from the mold is wrapped up in cooling. So the less wall thickness you have and the more consistent your wall thickness is, uh, the less cooling time and the less money you'll have to spend uh, on that part. And some uh, basic wall thicknesses for given materials are over in this table. If you want to use those as a reference, they're a good start. The second commandment for injection molding is to utilize uh, ribs and bosses for structure. So ribs and bosses are surfaces that extend off of the nominal wall some amount in order to reinforce structurally the part in that area. Uh, you want your wall thickness to be roughly uh, 50 to 60 percent of your nominal wall. So however thick your wall is, and of course it can change, that's going to dictate how wide the rib is. Um, and Ribs can give you strength in a third order, so the taller this rib is, um, it's going to give you a lot of strength relative to its height. It's a great way to add strength and structural rigidity to a part without thickening the nominal wall. Thickening the nominal wall, again, is going to cause a lot of additional cooling time and additional cost, so we want to use local reinforcement with ribs to uh, create structural rigidity in our parts. Uh, the third commandment for injection molding is to avoid sharp corners and transitions. So this is for several reasons, but the material is going to flow around these corners when it fills the mold and you don't want it transitioning from fat to thin to fat sections again. You don't want it to transition certainly from thin to fat sections. That causes a lot of uh, material flow issues. So we want a nice constant wall uh, through the part so that it flows uh, around these corners very easily. And also from a stress standpoint, uh, there's a very uh, strong correlation between uh, sharp corners and mechanical failures in products. So we want to make sure that we keep all our corners nice and round uh, so that we don't have failures when they're put under stress. Uh, the fourth command of injection molding is to avoid thin sections and thin steel. So uh, there's a lot of force involved in injection molding up to 18,000 psi uh, and with that kind of force if you have thin steel conditions or thin sections in the mold uh, when that type of force is imparted on them, it can create, uh, it, can, it can break the mold, it can break sections of the mold, certainly, so we want to make sure that we don't have thin, narrow sections in our mold, uh, which could break. Talk to your custom molder or somebody east-west, and we can make recommendations on what uh, geometry changes need to be made so you don't have these conditions. Uh, in addition to that, it may also makes it harder to machine, so when you have thin sections like this in a mold, it's hard for a uh, a work center or an NC to get their cutter down in those thin sections. Uh, so it's a lot easier if we use nice big fat sections on parts to do that. You see in this case we moved the parting line from the top of the part to the bottom of the part and it allowed us to get around this. Thin. The fifth commandment of injection molding is to avoid undercuts or side action. So undercuts are areas in the mold where the steel cannot pull or open without interfering with the parts. So you notice in this case we've got some small plastic nubs that the steel that's forming these is actually trapped on the inside of the part. So if it were to pull uh, past those small nubs it would either rip them off or it would at least scrape them and potentially cause damage to your mold. So when, we, when we're designing our molds we want to eliminate these types of conditions. So in 
Uh, other cases, what you might have to have if you do have side action is you may have to have hydraulic cylinders uh, to move steel in and out or sliders or lifters which do the same thing. They actually move the steel. This complicates the mold, uh, increases the mold cost and cycle time. It also decreases the life of the mold itself. So there's a lot of reasons why you want to be careful uh, to avoid uh, side action in your injection mold parts. A lot of times it can't be avoided. Uh, it's not something that is uh, uh, that we can't work around or that injection molders and custom molders are not used to working with but there is a cost to it. So a good DFMA or design for manufacturing and assembly exercise would root this out. You might be able to take this part, break it up into two separate parts that are bonded together or eliminate the side action in some other way. But it's something that we need to be cognizant of when we're designing injection molded parts is to minimize or mitigate the amount of side action we have in our parts. Commandment number six is to use adequate draft on our injection molded parts. So draft is the taper that's on selected surfaces inside or on an injection molded part uh, so it can eject from the mold. So without draft, uh, the steel that would be on either side of these surfaces, when the mold opens, would drag across those surfaces. It would cause uh, unlikely or unsightly uh, uh, marks on the part and in some cases could uh, eventually ruin the mold. So what we do is we put taper or draft at least a half a degree or so on surfaces that are um, normal or in the direction of pull uh, so that we can properly eject those parts in the mold. Uh, commandment number seven is uh, tolerancing for process capability. So this is something we see even from seasoned engineers. They will provide us prints or parts which are toleranced in such a way that the part is going to be very difficult to manufacture, manufacture and hold tolerance or it can't be manufactured at all. So one of the references we have is uh, the Trade Association for Plastics Industry, which is the SPI has uh, guidelines for you to go by for dimensioning and tolerancing a part. So uh, it's done by material. So I have an example here of ABS where I could go to the ABS um, guideline for tolerancing and based on the dimension it will tell me uh, what is an appropriate tolerance for a dimension of that type. Uh, so reference your SPI, it's www.spi.org uh, is the reference you would go to and they have by material types they have reference sheets so you can appropriately tolerance your part. Commandment number eight is using simple calculations and mold flow analysis to predict behavior. So one of the benefits we have living in a digital world is that we can uh, predict what the mold flow and the molding behavior of a mold is going to be before we actually build the mold. There's a couple ways we do this. Uh, the first way is to calculate what's called the flow length. So the flow length is something that can be done once you select a gate location and knowing the geometry of your part. So this is something that's easily done in SOLIDWORKS or PRO-E or any 3D CAD system, is measuring the distance that the material would have to flow to the last point of fill. And taking that distance and dividing it by your wall thickness is going to give you a number and that number is called the flow length. So it's basically how far the material has to flow to fill the part. Uh, some of the standard, um, actually maximum recommended flow lengths uh, based on certain materials are given in these tables. So you can actually take that measurement, compare it to what you see in the table, and then if your um, flow length is greater than it is and should be in this table, there's a couple things you can do. Number one is thicken your wall, which is not a great idea. It will lower your flow length. A better idea would be to go in and, and add or move the gates. So start moving your gates around in your mold flow analysis package and uh, to reduce this flow length. Uh, on that subject, again, is something called mold flow analysis. This is something that East-West can do, or most custom molders can do it, is they can actually simulate, um, based on your 3D part and selected gate and material specifications, what the fill of that part is going to look like. So we can actually go in and this uh, has an animation that would allow us to see where the last point of fill is, how much injection pressure we need, are there going to be areas that aren't going to fill properly, or where we're going to have uh, molding defects, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of predictive behavior that we can generate and uh, infer from using mold flow analysis. Commandment nine is to beware of a couple of molding anomalies um, called knit lines and short shots. So knit lines are uh, areas where the melt fronts have recombined. So as the material comes into the mold, it's going to uh, flow through the mold in such a way that it may have to go around a feature and then come back again. And where it rejoins itself, that area is called a knit line. And that area is actually only about three quarters as strong as the section right next to it. So knit lines are really unavoidable. It's basically a function of the geometry of your part 
and the location and quantity of your gates. But we can make sure that, for instance, if this were a high stress area of the part, that we gate the part in a different location so that the knit line is not located on the high stress area of the part. Uh, another anomaly we might uh, encounter is something called a short shot. So a short shot is an area where the mold simply can't fill. It's pushed the material as hard as it can, as far as it can, and you'll actually see a chunk that's missing. It looks like somebody just took a bite out of the part. Uh, it's actually just missing in that area, and that's again something that we can predict with mold flow analysis. Uh, the last commandment, commandment number 10 of injection molding, is uh, optimizing uh, gate location. So uh, the gate is the area that the uh, material enters the mold, and we have several different types of gate uh, types that we can use depending upon your part geometry and um, the way the pattern that the uh, material is going to fill the mold. So again, we would run mold flow analysis on a part. We might start with a standard sprue gate or a uh, tab gate, and if we were encountering some issues, for instance, maybe the mold doesn't fill, we might choose to use a fan gate, which is a wider gate, allows the material to flow into the part better. So this is something you should insist on from any injection molder, whether it be east-west or someone else, uh, that they show you what the gate locations and types are going to be, uh, the locations of the ejector pins, which are the pins that are going to push off, uh, push the part off of the mold, and also the location of the parting line, where the part's actually going to uh, separate the, the different two halves of the mold. So those are the uh, Ten Commandments for Injection Molding. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at jtayden at ewmfg.com or contact your uh, custom molding. Thank you.